welcome everyone. We have a good topic for us to enjoy uh, today. A uh, little bit of a little bit of a change of pace. Um, this is something that uh, Chantal and I had been discussing for a while. Um, we wanted to bring uh, with us on the panel today uh, experts in three different uh, areas of study and have them talk a little bit about what they think are the most interesting or challenging questions um, or problems in their field. And so today with us we have um, um, Mike Shaw, uh, who is an um, educator and scientist, uh, teaches chemistry. Um, he's a professor of inorganic chemistry at Illinois Southern, uh, at Southern Illinois University. And uh, he will be addressing the question of how do we provide energy to everyone in an environmentally responsible way? Um, and probably with a focus on solar power. Um, we also have with us uh, Stephen uh, Gazier, uh, who is a biologist currently at uh, DuPont, um, who are, he does education and research in molecular biology. And uh, Stephen will talk to us about the origins of life. Um, and then hopefully um, we will also have Alex Hastings with us today. He's having uh, technical issues with Second Life, but hopefully he can join us later. Um, and Alex is a paleontologist and will talk to us about some of the interesting work going on in the field of paleontology if he can join us. And um, with that, I would like to turn over um, uh, our, uh, let's, um, uh, I'd like to begin with uh, Mike, I think, um, to talk about um, uh, uh, providing us, uh, providing um, clean energy for the future. And with that, um, Mike, please introduce yourself and, and uh, let's uh, 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 tell us about your thoughts on this energy. Okay. Um, well, you did a great job of introducing me already. Um, um, but if I repeat, then um, that's, that's a risk we take. Uh, Mike Shaw, um, I'm a uh, professor of inorganic chemistry at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Um, I'm just outside of uh, St. Louis. Um, in Illinois, in the USA. Uh, lovely day here. We haven't had any uh, tornadoes yet, um, but uh, there's, always, there's always the rest of the weekend. Um, so um, with, with, with that, you know, I, I kind of wanted um, to uh, talk about what some of the big questions in chemistry are. I'll, I'll move my screen out a little bit. I, I just have like 13 slides or something. Um, edit. Up. I am recording this in Zoom, so uh, my recording, of course, will have me fiddling with the screen and doing all sorts of things. All right, I think that that almost does it. Let's get it in the middle, and I actually think it's uh, got the right angle. All right, so let's escape out of that. Okay, so some big questions in chemistry. Um, you know, when when the topic came up. The immediate thing that came to mind, what are um, you know the big unanswered questions in science? Um, to me, is how do we um, provide a good standard of living on um, for everyone on the planet? And uh, for our society, that means we have to um, be able to give people access to energy. And over the years, I've seen some lovely talks. Um, and uh, articles, uh, especially by Dan Nocira, who is a professor at MIT on this very question. Um, and in fact, uh, a couple of days ago, I encountered um, this uh, on my screen here. I've got a tiny little pointer that's moving around. Um, that's the front cover of an Accounts of Chemical Research. That's a journal. And uh, this particular issue uh, from March uh, 21st, 2017, was all about the holy grails in chemistry. Basically, a bunch of 45 articles by um, professors um, who are um, doing research in chemistry. About 10 of them are um, having to do with energy. Okay, so here's some of the titles. Um, the Holy Grails, K 
chemistry enabling and economically viable CO2 capture utilization and storage strategy. Because remember that our energy use is also tied up with the emission of greenhouse gases given our uh, reliance on fossil fuels for energy uh, production. So anything we can do to produce energy while minimizing CO2 or capturing CO2 is important. Um, Cyborgian uh, material design for solar fuel production. This is um, having uh, microorganisms on electrodes, essentially, and um, you know, having these hybrid um, uh, designs for having the uh, microorganisms make fuels or make things that we can use um, using solar energy. Um, I talked about perovskite sol solar cells uh, very recently. Um, I'll talk a little bit about them uh, today as well. Um, future porous materials. Um, I hope you don't mind I'm saying a few words about each of these. The porous materials may seem like a strange one when we're talking about energy, but I think some of you have heard of um, the hydrogen economy. If we're trying to um, use hydrogen as a energy carrier, I'm not going to say fuel because there's no hydrogen mines on this planet. Um, the um, problem with hydrogen is that it's a gas and you have to store it. It's very efficient to store it under high pressure, but if uh, you want to use hydrogen uh, for the general consumer, you don't really want everybody to have a high pressure tank of hydrogen. Shades of the Hindenburg. I mean, it would, uh, oh, the humanity is terrible. So porous materials are, um, and one application would be um, to help with the storage safely of vast amounts of hydrogen at low pressure. Okay, um, heterogeneous catalysis, uh, that's again tied up with taking energy solar energy, making um, compounds out of it, that could be fuels. Semiconductor surface chemistry, again, for the catalysis, photovoltaics, taking light and using it. Um, this next one is about batteries, um, inorganic ionic matrices. Um, there's not that much lithium on Earth, so uh, there's probably not enough lithium to provide everybody with lithium battery storage for uh, solar energy, even though right now that seems to be a very promising, um, um, promising way to store energy. There's some problems with it. If there's not enough lithium, then uh, it's not going to be fair to everyone. So alternatives have to be found. Right? Yeah, I think the only source for lithium on the planet or the vast majority is uh, like from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah. Uh, and which is uh, quite fraught. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, all of these, all of these issues of fairness and uh, science um, really have to be looked at in a political context as well. Right. Um, and my last three here, uh, self-repairing energy materials. Um, well, um, did you know that, um, Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll doesn't last very long. I think it actually has like a half-life of like 15 minutes or so when it's actually um, uh, for the synthesizing. There are various repair mechanisms that um, uh, fix it back up after it's uh, done its job. Um, you know, but if if you want like a solar array on your roof, you want something that's going to last uh, 20 odd years or more. And, and not just kind of go away 15 minutes after you put it together. So, um, you know, and in fact, if there's some small damage uh, cracks or hail or something like that, having a material that can repair itself is a, um, is a, uh, a great advantage. Um, finally, two, last two, one of them here for polymer electrolytes. That again is for uh, rechargeable batteries, uh, lithium batteries in this case. Finally, getting back to uh, Dan Nocera, solar fuels and solar chemicals industry. So I'm actually going to go and talk about this last one a little bit more because it aligns exactly with what I want to talk about. Um, so the problem is that there's a lot of solar energy available on uh, the planet. The sun's in the sky. Even on cloudy days, you can get some solar energy. But there's things like, oh, night. Night is a problem if you run on solar energy. So you have to have some storage. Here's a little graph. 
And I do promise I'll talk about the little graph rather than just saying, hey, here's a little graph. Um, uh, blue line, the blue line is basically like the uh, utility load on, let's see, I think it's in Arizona. That's basically um, high power demand during the day, low at night. The black line is um, uh, one um, solar power um, station's output um, during over over a day. I think it's sampled every couple of minutes. So, and you can see that there's a general sort of line that goes up, right, and then down. And uh, but there's clouds. And you can see the power comes off with clouds, but still. Um, and there's also different scales. Remember the scales here. One is like for the whole state. One is just for one power station. If you had a thousand power stations like this, you could, or two thousand, you could probably match some of the daily load. Um, but the main problem here that I'm uh, trying to draw your attention to is that it's um, there's power during the day, uh, but there's none at night from solar. So how do you um, Smooth out the peaks and the valleys, right? So yes, hydrogen hydrogen is more of an energy carrier. If we can make hydrogen somehow, we can use it and burn it somewhere else, and that'd be responsible. We'd make the hydrogen from water, and we'd uh, burn it and get water back. That'd be a very nice, responsible way that would not contribute to greenhouse gases. But it's not like uh, methane or uh, coal or something. In fact, most hydrogen industrially is actually made from um, hydrocarbons. Uh, the water gas shift reaction um, basically takes um, like methane and water um, and turns it into, um, I think, something like carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So that's that's terrible. Right? So. I do want to say there's old school ways of uh, solar power. Um, you know, there's a plant in California that, uh, $2 billion plant, I think, that uh, uses solar power. It basically focuses mirrors onto uh, one central location. It's a bit of a death ray because migratory birds fly into uh, the beam and literally catch fire and die. So it's estimated between 25,000 and 100,000 a year die like that. So that's eh, that may not be the best design. I like this design from Morocco, but we're simply taking um, smaller mirrors and focusing them onto um, uh, pipes of, uh, I'll call it coolant. And that coolant is basically used to um, uh, charge up a heat sink, uh, make it very hot, and that heat sink, again, can run uh, um, you know, heat some uh, water or something like that and uh, run a generator um, to provide a lot of power. So this is a, this is a lovely, um, more old school uh, design. Hmm, fascinating. I actually wasn't aware that there were some installations that use the, the, the focusing of the, of the solar power. So that seems quite encouraging to me. Yeah, once upon a time, I heard and I can't remember, and I, I've, I haven't been able to find this, but I, I, I heard that in the 1800s, there was a scheme to uh, basically focus sunlight um, in the Sahara on a boiler, and essentially use the uh, boiler to run a generator. And that seemed to make a lot of sense to me, um, but I uh, actually think politics got in the way of um, the construction of the um, the plant that was supposed to uh, make this happen. So oh, again, politics. Nice. Yeah. yeah. But, but um, you know, so so responsible use of uh, solar energy. What are the parts of the problems? Well, how do we harvest the energy? Um, and there's uh, lots of different ways. So we could use biofuels, and that's a that's a whole other um, that's a whole other talk. Um, Solar cells is kind of what I'm focusing on here. The old school. This is the um, this is the uh, link to a um, um, uh, the, the the information about the California project. Um, you know, parts of the problem include how to harvest the energy and then how to get it back, how to store it and retrieve it. Right? Rechargeable batteries sound good, but they've got some limitations. You have to have really light batteries 
because otherwise if you're um, lugging around a big heavy battery, the energy you have harvested might not be enough to actually move the battery, right? Uh, that's okay if you're uh, heating your house um, or running your house, but uh, for a mobile platform like a solar powered car or something, you're gonna need really light, um, really light uh, energy uh, storage, right? How do we store it? So, Fuel production. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, well, I just, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just, while I'm thinking of it before I forget, I just wanted to mention um, a year or two ago, um, there was a reporter um, from the New Yorker magazine who did a profile of um, an Exxon executive. Um, and I heard the reporter interviewed on Fresh Air, um, but I don't remember his name. Um, but he, he made a comment that has always stuck with me, which is he said that um, uh, Exxon, in its long-term strategic planning, considers uh, battery technology to be its biggest threat, its biggest competitor, um, you know, down the road. And I just am curious to see if that has the ring of truth to you. And um, uh, oh God, and, yes. And I think it, and I think it makes this discussion of battery and, and the storage of solar power that much more um, important. Yeah, it does. Um, we have free energy. Um, flying at us from the sky every day. And there is a lot of energy in sunlight. Um, I don't have figures on me right now, but um, you know, approximately if you take what on the equator, if you take a square meter of space and integrate the sunlight it receives over a day, um, it's kind of, on par with the same amount of energy that it might receive in a millisecond from a ground zero atomic blast. There's a lot of energy. Um, if we can harvest it, right now uh, our efficiencies are very low, like 25% uh, or so of um, uh, efficiency of solar cells is really good right now. I mean, if we can efficient, um, harvest more of this energy and store it, then we're in good shape. Um, yeah, basically Exxon's going to be uh, very threatened by um, the idea that uh, energy from the sky um, gets uh, stored um, and they don't get a cut. You know? Unless, of course, they change their business model and uh, get into the maintenance and um, um, supply of some of these uh, storage facilities. You know, and there's also, um, you know, fuel production um, and uh, old school stuff. So, so uh, this is just a graphic that shows you some of the time scales. You can see uh, this is like the logarithmic scale minutes. So, um, you know, if you're using solar directly, then um, it's available on a uh, fairly generous time scale. If you're just storing in capacitors, for example, then that's a short uh, time scale. But, you know, we have old school ways like flywheels or rechargeable batteries. But it is a fuel thing. And I consider hydrogen, H2, to be a fuel, uh, an example of a fuel. If we can uh, turn solar energy to split water efficiently into um, hydrogen and move the hydrogen around, it can deliver power in the short uh, term, or, but it can also be stored for years and deliver power in the long term. Um, if I can also, it's just interject for a second, too, while you're yes, your thoughts. I wanted to draw attention to a comment from Tagline regarding Exxon and their um, uh, early intention to become a diversified energy company um, and how they basically betrayed us with respect to that by denying global warming and so forth. But uh, yep. it just made me, it reminded me, it made me think of an anecdote I'd like to share re kind of related to that. Um, my late wife's um, her father, my father-in-law, was um, 
a very high executive with uh, Gulf Oil before it was uh, subsumed into Chevron. Mm -hmm. um, so this would have been, I guess, in the 80s. He lived in Houston then. And, um, you know, I remember talking to him about um, whether, you know, about, you know, about the oil companies diversifying their portfolio. And, um, you know, and I was prompted by that because I noticed that Exxon owned a lot of real estate around uh, uh, Houston and, in fact, owned entire subdivision housing subdivisions that kind of circle Houston. Uh, some of those are actually owned by Exxon. And so I was kind of wondering, you know, well, you know, is that really contribute to their bottom line and so forth? Um, and my father-in-law looked at me and said, nothing makes money like oil. You know, and he went on to say um, that uh, we're not an energy company. We're an oil company. So pretty much closing the door on any notion that oil companies are interested in really diversifying, uh, getting into they consider themselves oil companies. Yeah. Um, so one of the one of the closing statements that Nasira has in his most recent article is um, that um, it's going to be very very difficult for alternative energy sources to compete with the entrenched fossil fuel um, um, production and distribution industry. I mean, the infrastructure for that distribution of that energy is uh, just so um, entrenched now that uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to switch to other ways unless um, people demand change. So, yeah. So, um, getting, getting into some uh, science here, I thought I'd just kind of give you a couple of definitions. Right, so um, uh, different sorts of cells or electrical cells um, would be involved in um, this process of taking um, solar energy and turning it into into fuels or storing it electrically. Right, so uh, one of them, the first one would be uh, the uh, solar cells we're um, been discussing. Um, and there's questions there, uh, silicon versus the new perovskites that have been uh, found and ha have been um, researched um, in depth in the last 10 years. The electrolysis cells, how to make fuels, right? Um, and what fuel do we make? Uh, do we stick with hydrogen because that's possible? Or is it possible to uh, make a different sort of fuel, methanol or something like that, that uh, could be stored as a uh, liquid and doesn't have the explosion hazards, right? Um, if you're uh, making a fuel, then to turn it back into electricity, you need a fuel cell. So again, research into fuel cells to uh, burn whatever fuel um, uh, efficiently is important because uh, making the fuels and uh, breaking bonds and uh, using the fuels is not always uh, trivial. Finally, uh, the batteries, which can do direct storage and retrieval. Um, let's see, a uh, quick definition of primary batteries, like uh, one of your Duracell things. It's not uh, going to be a uh, rechargeable one. A secondary battery is uh, the term used for a rechargeable battery. Things you have to worry about are just how heavy the battery is. Um, let's see, Tagline has a comment. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, Tagline is, makes a comment that the oil companies have the, have the uh, I'll say resources <laughs> to, um, you know, to, to compete with, uh, with um, uh, you know, practically with small nations and things like that. And exactly. That ability to influence uh, politics disproportionately. Exactly, exactly. Um, there's a lot of money and a lot of uh, infrastructure. So it just means that there's a, a lot of um, um, in inertia, that's it, inertia in how we use energy today. And honestly, some of it is quite unfair because uh, uh, where the infrastructure doesn't reach people, um, 
you know, like um, in developing nations, they do not have access to um, energy. Solar fuels are local. Um, you know, basically, if having a solar array on the top of your house um, that drives some sort of um, fuel uh, production and storage that can be um, uh, local with your house, that takes you off the grid and allows you to have a standard of living higher than you might otherwise have if you wait for the infrastructure, big infrastructure, to get you. Yes. Yes. So um, this, right. is, this is just a graphic from Dan. Let me, uh, let me move on a little bit here. I'm talking a bit too much, sorry. Um, you know, in the last 10 years, people have been looking at electrodes. Um, there's an old um, paradigm um, where one material was supposed to make hydrogen and oxygen. That's been replaced by a new paradigm where you have different materials. And this paradigm has allowed uh, uh, for uh, much better um, hydrogen. Uh, production to happen, but there's still a lot of um, um, work to be done. You know, and the payoff, of course, if uh, one can use the hydrogen that one generates to feed the bacteria and have these cyborg type of cells, then you could uh, make fuels, materials, starches, fertilizer. Um, we did not have enough uh, um, um, agriculture ability without resorting to fertilizer to feed everyone on the planet. So this is an important issue. Right. All right. So how many more slides do you have? <laughs> oh, I got two. I'm sorry. Okay, um, let's, let's try. Let's try to get through them. So we can yeah, I was just going to I was just going <laughs> to mention the perovskites, but I've mentioned them before. Uh, and I did a whole talk on those. So if you're interested in the perovskites, um, there's the structure of them. I won't bore you with that. Uh, you can look at the YouTube video of my previous talk. And uh, we've been uh, summarizing as we've gone along. There's been a lot of progress in the uh, last 10 years. I've actually mentioned this particular statement and this particular statement. So with that, I'm ready to move on and um, you know allow other people to talk. Sorry about that. No problem at all. Um, I thought that was quite interesting, and uh, um, but uh, I think we we do need to move along here. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Alex Hastings to our panel. I'm not sure I can pronounce his second life name, Acherontisus. Um, <laughs> um, it's uh, Acherontisus. Can anybody Acheron hear me? Acheron all yeah, right, we're we working. Yes, I okay. hear you. Uh, yeah, a little. It's a little bit loud actually, but I think you'll be fine. Uh, Alex, I think uh, if you're ready, um, I was going to suggest maybe you go next in case, um, you know, in case for some reason your uh, technology uh, fails uh, before the end of our of our allotted time. Maybe we should get you, get you in while we can. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so um, Alex <laughs> is a paleontologist. That you've probably seen him talk here before. Uh, he holds the Fitzpatrick Chair of Paleontology. Paleontology at the Science Museum of Minnesota. And uh, he is here to talk to us about uh, some of the current issues in paleontology. So take it away. Cool, um, so thanks. Um, I actually am not able to see the screen right now. Um, so I'm just gonna assume it's up there. Um, and I think I have like a title slide there. Um, so uh, the, the question in paleontology that I was uh, choosing was uh, just the connection between life and climate change and trying to understand that. And it's something that uh, we've learned a lot about, but uh, there's still uh, a good lot more that we can learn from from the past in order to help kind of start to understand or anticipate um, trends for the future. Um, so let me, let me at least try and spin around here a little bit so I can maybe see the screen. Um, uh, Berga, maybe if do you mind yeah, I, switching to the second slide? Uh, I don't see the uh, the slide board either. Is it? Um, oh, that's not just me then. <laughs> no. So um, I I think uh, Alex had a slide um, or rather um, uh, 
Acaranta uh, uh, <laughs> um, um, Yeah, I rather uh, Mike had a slide. There we go. There it is. Hey, there's Did somebody's slide. There we go. All right. Yeah, I think those. Uh, I think those. That's Mike's uh, slide screen. Yeah. Um and. Uh, let's see if we can get your slides loaded up into it. Great. Bear with us here, folks. We're doing this by Very the seat sure. of our pants. <laughs> and I think uh, the I think the the dog wants us to uh, get on with it. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Just kidding. Up so I can follow along. Jeez. Um, well, I can kind of fill things in a little bit here. Um, so in terms of kind of the the different connections that uh, climate has had along kind of shaping evolution throughout the the many millions of years, um, has been um, kind of. First of all, kind of extinction and survival. Um, so that's kind of looking across the, you know, uh, three, three and a, more than three and a half billion years of life um, and seeing kind of where these major climate shifts have happened often are tied in with major die-offs um, for huge groups of life, uh, potentially, you know, at times even exceeding 90% of, of life on Earth. Um, so the... Uh, even fairly, what may seem like minor changes in climate can have very dramatic effects on life, and that um, has really shaped evolution um, for a large... Uh, it, it had these big sweeping turnovers as a result of, of climate shifts. Um, and uh, I do have, whenever we can get it up, I've got a slide um, kind of highlighting the big five mass extinctions. There are kind of five major key points in um, the history of life on Earth where we've gone through these uh, massive, massive shifts um, that have resulted in uh, huge die-offs and, and large uh, whole lines of evolution dying out. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Alex, can you... Oh, there we go. There's some slides. Do you... I was just going to say, if you can give me your slides... Um, then I think I can uh, work the projector. Um, um, there's a way you can uh, pass those to me. Um, uh, instant message or something. Um, so I had sent it in an email. Um, do you need something well, different from that? Well, I, did, I was just looking in the emails to see if I could um, show that somehow I don't, I can't locate your attachments. Which, oh. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. Here we go. Uh, attachments. Let me see. No, nope, that's chemistry. No. Nope. All right. <laughs> this is the most exhilarating discussion you can have. <laughs> uh, uh, do you want Steve to go and then maybe uh, yeah, ask maybe them that'd to me right. and I could throw them up? Um, okay. Uh, Sorry, guys. Let's do that. So uh, let's go that way. them to me, you. Alex. Okay. Uh, tell you what, I'll email both of you. But yeah, go ahead on to the, the next segment. Sorry, everybody. That's okay. It was a, it was a trial run. Uh, we'll get back on track. All right. Uh, so. Um, our, uh, uh, we'll move on to our topic of biology. As I mentioned, we have uh, Stephen Gazier here uh, who is going to talk to us a little bit about the origins of life. All right, Baragon, thank you. And it's a pleasure to come to this group and talk about the big question in biology. I think biology is at an exciting time right now with a lot of the chemistry technology that has enabled new things. So, uh, but what I'm actually going to do, and the big question that's really still in the field is I think the oldest question, which is where do we come from? How did we get here? How is all the life on the planet? Where did it come from? So just to give you a little bit of background on myself, right now I'm in the genome editing group at, uh, well, what will soon be Corteva Agrosciences. It's going to spin off June 1st. 
and I'm in the genome editing group. And again, I don't represent the company, so nothing I said should be taken as. And uh, while CRISPR and Cas9 genome editing has been this very exciting new thing that has made a lot of headlines, gotten people very excited about biotechnology and things we can do, uh, I think that a lot of the synthetic biology is is kind of the the future idea of where we want, where a lot of interesting stuff will be, and the basis in biology and the academic science and research that goes on really does come down to understanding the basics of how things work. So we're not going to be able to do synthetic biology unless we really have a very good, clear understanding of the basics of how biology works. So. Uh, again, if you have any questions while I'm talking, one thing I do like about these panel structures is I try and lim limit myself to fewer slides. I make it a little bit more general and not get too detailed in some of the, uh, the aspects of it. So what I have up on the slide on the top left uh, are the basic cell structures of eukaryotic cells, and we ourselves are eukaryotes, although we are multicellular, and prokaryotes. And when we think about the basics of what represents life on the planet, it has to do with things that live in cells. That while there are these uh, elements called viruses, that in general we think about life as being these cellular components. And even though you look at these at prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, they look actually quite different and more complex, that a lot of all of life as we know it right now is explained largely by the, the central dogma of molecular biology. And this is something that James Watson uh, came up with and popularized, uh, I think about a decade after the discovery of the structure of DNA. And so, and the basic idea of this is that there's uh, DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acids, which are these long strings of information, and those can be copied to make more DNA, but they, and that's the, gen the basis of genetic information. And then also, those can be used as a template to make ribonucleic acids, so long strings of a very similar code. And then these RNA molecules can be used to uh, translate into proteins. And proteins are the things you are probably mostly familiar with in terms of looking at our body. If you were to look down at your hands right now, you would look at uh, you know, a lot of keratin, skin, uh, the surface coating of them, that other than the cell membranes that are represented there, you have things like your fingernails are made out of protein. And so the central dogma reflects kind of what we understand about how all life on the planet operates. And it's something that we would love to know how this first started coming about. Because one thing, when we think about the origin of life on the planet, it couldn't be all these all together work at the same time, right? You can't have the central dogma at the very beginning of life, because that would be incredibly impossible for them to all be working in concert in this way. So uh, an anonymous entity mentions in local chat that when we think about the origins of life on the planet, and I wasn't going to go too much into the timing and paleontology of early Earth, but that it does seem like these our, our archaeological evidence suggests, as well as uh, genetic clock evidence, suggests that life started yeah within about a billion years of when the planet was about cool enough to really sustain life as we know it. So it's very fascinating how, how quickly that came from apparently nothing. So I do want to introduce one topic, though, and this is something that in my previous life as a biology educator that was very frustrating. It's that textbooks would frequently have an opening chapter called The Definition of Life, and that they wouldn't actually offer a definition of life. They would actually talk about the characteristics of life and how things that follow these characteristics are what we can consider life. And so... Uh, energy metabolism, structure, uh, repeating patterns, uh, inheritance. These are things that people talk about characteristics. But I have this definition of life that I, I came up with to teach. And that's in the lower left-hand corner. And I consider life to be a discrete and localized set of ongoing chemical reactions and structural molecules that contain the blueprint for their ongoing chemistry and their whole holistic replication. Again, not that you just make more of the same molecules, but you actually take the whole entity that we're discussing as, as life and can make descendants. So, and that's something that I want to come back to when we think about how is it possible to have very early origins of life that um, 
can represent the simplest molecules that can do all these things. And Mike says he likes the definition because it doesn't limit it to carbon. And I think, yeah, one thing, if you if you look at this definition, and if you're a Star Trek fan or science fiction fan, you can actually replace chemical reactions with energy patterns or energy fields, and that would be something that you could apply to other life that follows the definition. So let me go on to the next slide. And before I get into the very basic chemistry of the origin of life, to me, there's always been one other very big question that people, to some degree, aren't pursuing with the same degree of vigor. But this is my honorable mention big question, which is how did eukaryotes come around? And when you look on the top left-hand corner, this is a little bit more of a blow-up of a prokaryotic cell. And you look at it, and it looks very complicated from a, from a first look. It's got a membrane. It's got internal comp components. It's got some very complex uh, DNA and chromosomes for its genetic instructions. It's got structures that help it move or, per helps, or perhaps help uh, it defend itself from other things. But, and this is how, again, that you look at the cladistic tree on the bottom, that represents bacteria. And this is what we know of as the simplest life forms, cellular life forms on the planet. And there's a large branch of also single-celled organisms known as the archaea. And they basically have quite distinct chemistry and in terms of how they do a lot of the basic aspects of life from prokaryotes. But their cell structure is largely very similar. And so we know that branch. And then that represented the majority of life on the planet for billions of years. And then eukaryotes come around, came around where they have much larger cells, internal components, internal membranes. And this complexity, uh, there's actually some degree of thought, and some of this is known for some organelles, but these internal structures or organelles are likely invading prokaryotes that end up taking residence and then became adapted to a function inside the larger eukaryote. And so this is something known as uh, biogenesis. And this is true for mitochondria. This is true for chloroplasts. Although people haven't found an explanation for all of the organelles and all the structures inside eukaryotes to explain it. So I don't think that's actually the most complicated part of what this makes a prokaryote distinct from eukaryote. What's actually more interesting is how the chromosome metabolism works. And what I have here on the top left-hand corner is a picture of a karyotype and the idea that uh, a cartoon of a chromosome representing a linear structure. And prokaryotes in archaea have circular chromosomes. And so this adaption from a circular chromosome to a linear chromosome, there's a lot of DNA metabolism that has to occur to help you keep that working correctly. Now, not only to keep it working correctly when you replicate it and, and transcribe off of it, but also when you go through cell divisions, you have to basically take these different entities and move them to two different sides of that, that replicating cell. And then what also is crazy, and this is represented in the lower right-hand corner, we think about meiosis. And meiosis is this process for, whereby we make gametes. We take our two copies of all of our chromosomes, and then we make gametes, like sperm and egg cells, that have only one copy of our genomes. And then what's powerful about this is that when gametes combine to make a new organism, you have lots of genetic recombination. That's what's represented on the lower left-hand corner, is the idea that uh, chromosomes can come together, they can recombine, you move them apart, reduce your chromosome content, and you get lots of recombination. So the idea that eukaryotes are so successful on the planet probably comes down to the fact that we have more genetic variability we can work with that's inherent with every generation. However, the components to doing this as compared to replicating and moving one copy of a, of a circular chromosome from one cell to your is an amazing amount of complex machinery. And I don't think all that's been worked out, but I think from my perspective, that is, a thing, I think, an important honorable mention about origins of life. Hmm. Okay, uh, so back to the original question. And when we think about origins of life, and again, this is, remember, a lot of biology is, is chemistry. So you're getting a double dose, of, at least, of chemistry today. That... Um, We, we have to think of ways that you can spontaneously generate the key components of a cell from just a chemical mixture. And so what I have up here on the top left-hand side is what's probably the most well-known and popularized uh, origins experiment, the Miller-Urey experiment, where they basically combined water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen, and they heated it up into a gaseous form, so it made the steam that went through. And then they shot it with the equivalent of lightning. So yeah, big input of energy that allows for chemical bonds to 
break and get reformed and then condense in a way that can give you something that might reflect a prebiotic soup, something that, at least in their thinking at the time, would represent the beginning chemistry um, of, the, of the ancient Earth, and then what sort of energy inputs you might have in order to make that come together. The, um, <laughs> the, um, and this worked. In fact, what they ultimately did was they, they published that they found 11 of the 20 known amino acids in human biology. And what's been interesting is over the decades, people have actually gone back and used more sensitive methods and gone back to this original equipment. His, uh, his former grad and postdoc students have done this. They've actually found over 20 different amino acids represented in this reaction. Again, not all the ones are used in biology, but there was actually a lot more complicated stuff that went on. And, there, and I should also say that since the 1950s, people have recreated this experiment using slightly different conditions. Some people have added catalytic metals and they found a large diversity of amino acids. Again, the building blocks of proteins. I, I realize I just forgot to mention amino acids are the building blocks of proteins that are present um, from these spontaneous reactions. Now, the other source that's also been discovered, once we had the opportunity to be able to go and, and see, to spect spectrally analyze comets, is that comets contain a wealth of amino acids as well. I think up to 300 different types of amino acids have been found in comets, where again, you have this input of so solar energy, uh, methane, ammonia, all available to actually create those. So it's possible that a lot of the early amino acids on the planet from um, comets impact. Okay, so the next component, when we think about cell membranes, these are lipid bilayers, and lipid bilayers is kind of basically the idea of soap, and that when you have soap aligned in the right way, where a lot of people picture these as balloons. And so if you imagine a bunch of balloons uh, that have all been let go and are on the ceiling, right? All the heads of the balloons are lined up on the ceiling and then the strings are coming down. So imagine that those strings like to interact with each other. And that's basically a monolayer of these types of fatty acids that form layers. And if you actually have the tails face into each other, you can do this. So you basically take soaps in solutions you agitate them, and you can make these things known as protocells or micelles that spontaneously form. This has been known for some time, just within, say, kitchen sinks or within lab environments. Yeah, this and is you... kind of, uh, it's it kind of just, uh, they thermodynamically arrange themselves. Fatty cells like this have a, a cool property, which is that they're, they're polar at the head and nonpolar at the tail. So they just naturally, when they're in a in a in a water environment, they just naturally align themselves in this uh, juncture to um, uh, so that the nonpolar tails um, are sequestered away from the water. So they just naturally arrange themselves like this. Yeah, and these natural arrangements allow you to one create barriers that you can say this is the outside of a cell versus the inside, and then the inner chemistry can be independent of that membrane. You can basically have some some basically self-contained aqueous comp compartment inside. Um, yeah, so, so Tagline mentioned something about clays, and I will be getting to that in the next talk in just a second. And so the thing that's, that people have been, so these have been known for some time to be able to form, uh, at least since the late 1800s, people scientifically made these. And the question has always been, how would these form in the early Earth and then interact? And that is, of course, the big challenge, is that basic Un, um, uninterrupted fatty acid membranes are impermeable to a lot of stuff that consider life. So we ha you also have to have this step at which you can make them permeable and regulated in order to actually be a cell, right? You can't just have them all be inside. Otherwise, it's not just normal. The cell won't function and be able to react to its environment. Okay, so let me get to the last one. This is the in most interesting one. But one thing to point out is that when we think about lipids, we think about DNA, we think about pr amino acids, they don't really have much capacity to code information. And so what has been the leading hypothesis for several decades now is the idea that RNA as a singular molecule must have been able to perform catalysis, be a structural chemical, and then also be able to replicate. And so uh, in the 1960s, there were a lot of experiments, uh, Joan Oro is the most well-known one, where they would react in, the in, in test tubes sugars with um, cyanide-based compounds. So what I'm showing here is 5-methylcytidine. Uh, so you see the, loop, the circular molecule 
on the top right there uh, has nitrogens in it, and that's where nitrogen, the cyanides contribute, other different from amino acids that can spontaneously form. And so th that is, again, some basic chemistry that can, where we can understand the building blocks of RNA. Um, but how would these form into long monomers, right? RNA and DNA are these long strings of these all put together. And so, um, yeah, and I think Tadline mentioned something that in the early 1900s, people were convinced that proteins and amino acids were coding functions. In that just turned out to be completely wrong. And there is a basis for why they thought that. But and so what's been, um, what was then later shown in the later 60s and a lot more work in the 70s is that different clay compounds can actually help RNA spontaneously form polymers, up to about 50 nucleotides. And so these Montemorlinites, a lot of work from the Ferris lab, has shown that it's possible to spontaneously get these long strings of these. Then once you have these spontaneous long strings, can they actually do the functions that we need to represent life? And so one of the more well-hailed and well-known experiments was at Showstack in 1993, where they took combinatorial libraries of RNA and ask, can they perform um, specific catalytic functions of putting RNA molecules together? So I should say, let me back up, that RNA, well, a lot of times we think of proteins as being the main enzymes and catalytic functions in cells. RNA has been shown uh, to catalyze RNA splicing, so it can chop other RNA molecules apart. And it's also involved in the protein synthesis. And so these are, these are aspects where we know there's catalytic function that RNA can do. And so the fact that Jack Shostak was able to show that you can basically ligate, an RNA molecule can ligate other RNAs together, was actually quite a move forward in the field. Uh, one thing that has not yet been demonstrated is the ability of RNA to take another RNA molecule and make a basic complementary copy of it to then yield this idea of replicating your genetic blueprint. So that's, I would say right now, probably the holy grail of the field that allows, um, that would say, really confirm the RNA world. Now, some of the advances in the idea, so we talk about RNA as this ribonucleotide. There actually are other backbones and other, R and other sugars that may allow. So arabinose is a, another variant. There's also um, uh, oh, blanket, fructose, which is a five-carbon sugar, not a six-carbon sugar. And the idea that there may have been slightly different sugar compounds that were the initial RNA molecules can be very attractive because some of their chemical properties are a little bit more amenable to replication. And um, Mike Shaw has something says something in local text that is a little bit um, a little bit over my head for me as a biochemist. Um, oh, okay, I see. So he's he's mentioning the idea that there are ideas that maybe DNA could have still been an important molecule, both as a catalysis, maybe an earlier form of it, and um, yeah, no need to apologize. It was, I just just had I had to pause to read it, so I was letting people know I was pausing to read it. That the RNA world is the leading hypothesis, but you're mentioning another one that maybe DNA still could have been a catalytic molecule in a slightly different or more slightly different form. And so I think we don't want to dismiss other possibilities, and that's a really good. All right, so let me get to. Um, so I think to summarize here, what we really have is this idea that we have a lot of understanding of the basic chemistry that can give us the building blocks that lead to life. Now, we're still missing, and this is why I think this is a big unanswered question, how these things can actually come together in a way that then leads to a functional replicating cellular life. And uh, I think that's where, it's, it's a big question, and I think it's a really hard question, something that we may never be able to fully answer exactly how it happened, but otherwise be satisfied with models in which we understand how it could have happened. So we'll see how the next 20 years goes. But there's been a lot of advances in biochemistry that allow us, and the ability to do combinatorial synthesis of molecules like RNA and DNA that may allow us to answer these questions. And so that was my segue into the last topic I want to talk about, which is the idea that we can synthesize RNA and DNA molecules chemically. I was just going to ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this, and this is amazing stuff. So let me talk about one of the pioneers in the field, Craig Venter who actually was a, uh, a private scientist, he uh, had his own company, that they made the, the goal of sequencing the human genome, and that's what his company is most well known for, was that he led an independent, uh, non-government, non-academic effort to sequence the human genome. And in fact, they did, in, a, in essence, co-publish with the Human Genome Project. 
but his other, he's been very interested in very basic synthetic biology. And so some landmark stuff that he and his group have done is in 1995, they sequenced the genome of mycoplasma genitalia. Yes, that is exactly what it sounds like. And they found that, and they knew this was a very small, slow-growing, independent organism, although, again, parasitic. And it had only 470 genes, and they could actually inactivate a bunch of them so that they had a working, living organism that was only 375 genes. Right? So this basic idea of, taking the, given the, the life that we have on the planet now, how can we find this minimal set of genes that really make it work? Uh, and so I think this could reflect what are something that you have in those, what are the basic biochemical needs and genetic needs you have for that very basic early organism? Uh, now, in 2008, they synthesized a copy of that. So, again, a whole de novo synthesis of the nucleotides in order to um, make that organism. And they, they, they discarded that one because it's very slow growing and hard to work with. Uh, so, they moved to Mycoplasma mycotes, which is um, a million base pairs. And they, again, also synthesized de novo a version of its genome. And then, through a bunch of basically reductionist types of properties. Oh, um, they basically said, and, and sorry, what's shown here on the lower left-hand side is in culture, individual cells of that synthesized mycoplasma. And so they called it JVCI version 1. And through a bunch of reductionist type of practices, taking this segment of DNA, is it necessary or not? This segment of DNA, is it necessary or not? They eventually came up with a reduced size that's uh, half, a, half a megabase in terms of the sequence available. It has a total of 473 genes. And they published that in 2016 as JV, JCVI version 3. And so this is uh, a hallmark in terms of this is a minimal organism that was also completely synthesized. Now again, they synthesized the DNA and they hijacked an existing mycoplasma cell uh, in order to get it to jumpstart in terms of being a cellular life. But this, this is the idea that we can basically synthesize minimal organisms uh, from scratch, and this is something that, from a technological standpoint, you can start thinking about what genes you may or may not want to add. Uh, but I think also Ventner is still very interested in what is just a, the basic minimal. So, so my last slide. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, if I just uh, just kind of in interject here, so I'm a little bit. So you can um, synthesize these the genome for these minimal organisms, and then. Do those genes get expressed and create all of the cellular machinery it needs to sort of be alive? Is that that really works? Yep, yep, that's that is correct. That, that is you can wild. Use, you can use machines to synthesize DNA. Now you have to do some special work. You can you can't synthesize in a machine really long segments of DNA, but you, what you do is you synthesize a bunch of them and get them to connect together in special ways. And I won't go through the biology of that. But, uh, but um, well, do these but do these minimal cells do they have it, like organelles, uh, mitochondria, or ribosomes, or anything like that? Yeah. Or so just... the, yeah, the mycoplasma that they they strip them of DNA, and these are existing cells in a cell culture. They strip their DNA out, and so all the ribosomes, proteins are all pre-existing that can then start replicating the DNA that then gets injected into it. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Now, I will say there are things known as like cell lysate systems where you can have, you can put DNA into it and it will make protein, it will make RNA, although there's no membrane structures in that. And that's something that's used in biology, uh, industrial biology. But in terms of what the vendor was trying to do is that, yeah, they needed, it's most, it was easiest to take some pre existing cell packet in order. Yeah, sure, that makes sense. Uh, now, yeah, I actually, one of my colleagues at Corteva Agrosciences, he's well known and published, he actually synthesized the first um, yeast artificial chromosome. So we're at the point now where we can synthesize and recombine together, uh, you know, simple one-celled eukaryotic chromosomes. So I think that's pretty fascinating. All right, so my last slide, last two slides, my last topic, is the idea of what we can do when it comes to the ability to synthesize genomes from scratch. And I want to remind people and when we talk about the central dogma, we go from RNA, which are these strings of A, G's, C's, and U. So T is replaced by U in RNA. And that when you take three of these at a time, you can basically have a total of 64 different what are called codons or tri triplets, triplets. And you can use these to specify on a one-to-one -one basis that this one codon means this one amino acid. 
and we actually have multiple codons that can code for the same amino acids. So on the left hand side is something very similar to what I actually have on my desk. There's a codon table that says this string of letters codes for, in groups of three, code for this particular amino acid. And then there are also three stop codons. And what the code for life, how this actually works is that there are in the cell what are known as amino acyl tRNA synthetases. And these are proteins that take a particular amino acid and bind to a particular tRNA, and then the tRNA is what is the adapter for when translation is occurring to say, oh, this codon means this. And, and so this is how this whole basically Rosetta Stone of life is set up. And the thing is, we can change this now. We can do a lot. And this is what was just published a month ago, right? This is landmark, up-to-date, hot-off-the-presses type of stuff going on in synthetic biology. That the um, published in Nature, what this group did in, uh, oh, in England, I'm blanking on where, they, um, they basically recoded the entire genome. And they, they, did, they did have some false starts or some things that don't work. But they basically got rid of two codons for Siri, and that's what I have yellowed out in a bar up left hand side. They also got rid of one of the stop codons. There are three codons that say, oh, stop making proteins here. Well, you only need really one codon in the cell to represent this. And so they basically have recoded and have living organisms where they've been recoded for life. And what's amazing about this, like the future possibilities for this is that and one of the early applications is that if you have your own unique code or you're missing the ability to use, have certain codons represent a protein, then you can be resistant to viruses, right? Viruses can't replicate inside of you. Um, so then viruses can't make more protein and you are resistant to, to that type of pathogen. And then the other thing is that if you have these, if you're freeing up the genetic code where you can put in more stuff and make new you know, amino acid tRNA synthetases that put on new amino acids, we can start coming up with proteins that don't exist in here. And people have done this synthetically, but once you can start making organisms and evolve organisms with new amino acids and potentially new, completely novel proteins, then we can start doing some pretty amazing new stuff that, again, origins of life have helped lead us to the ability to, I think, redesign and create novel types of life. Now, there's a question from Tagline, which is, would not the epigenetic aspects of a synthesized cell be hit or miss? And epigenetics, this concept where just because you have DNA, it doesn't mean things get expressed. You can have extra chemistry on them that says the gene will not be expressed or maybe is expressed more highly. And that's what epigenetics is called. Well, bacterial chromosomes don't really do epigenetics. There's not something where you have to worry about that in terms of the, the histone modifications and expression patterns in basic prokaryotes. So this is really kind of not a question for this type of synthetic biology, but it's a very good question if we were to think about trying to use synthetic DNA for eukaryotic gene therapy. But that basically ends my talk, and I think this okay. is where I was really leading to. Well, let me just tell you, let me just finish that. The real unanswered question is not necessarily the origin of life, but what does the future hold for understanding new design life? And then that fantastic. Was yeah, fantastic. You know, I think there was, uh, I just recently heard about a recent report of, um, you know, novel proteins being produced by these synthetic uh, cellular systems. So that's, so that's very cutting edge. Yeah, that has been done, I think, on a limited basis, but you, I think it's really hard to do that. Um, yeah, I think they, what, there was a group that had on a, on a episomal vector, or sorry, an additional vector, some codons and some different amino acid synthesis. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You're thinking of a group that used a, a four codon code. I think, I think. so. Yes, that sounds yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, I was listening to a report about that. Yeah, so that, I read about that. I'm not as familiar with it, but it's, it's the same type of idea that we can start recoding things and start doing amazing stuff with the synthesis of the building blocks of life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all right. Thanks very much, Stephen. That was fantastic. Um, uh, and um, let's move. So, um, Alex, can you do a voice check and see if uh, uh, see if uh, you're still uh, live here, and um, maybe we can bring your slide screen over. There we go. I think uh, I think Day has your slide screen over. Um,
All right, let's uh, hope we can, um, okay. Uh, okay, uh, Alex, can you do a little um, mic check for us to make sure your voice is working? And it looks like we have a screen for your slides set up back there. <coughs> is that me and my audio cut out? Yes, there we go. I think maybe your mic was off, so now, you, now we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so uh, again, quickly, um, connections between climate and life over time, and I feel like this is where kind of paleontology has the ability to kind of uh, give us some clues into what to anticipate for the future and, and by better understanding this relationship between climate and evolution. And uh, by really delving into the fossil record, understanding what those uh, nuances are and, and hopefully kind of have better clues. Um, so I was saying before, there have been kind of five recognized uh, big extinction events, and each of these have been tied in one way or another to um, dramatic shifts in climate. Now, that's not exclusively warming. It can be cooling. Um, in one case, is uh, a lot of kind of acid buildup in the atmosphere. Um, but these have all been kind of tied one way or another into big, big shifts um, in climate through time. And my screen is refreshing. Okay. Um, and by kind of studying this relationship, we can get a better sense of, of kind of where we are um, with things. Um, let's see. And please feel free to kind of interject um, as you like around. Um, so if you got questions and stuff, I'll try and keep up with the chat board here. Um, okay. Let's see. All right. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, and we're loading. Sorry, I'm working on like a very old laptop as well, so this is all extra clunky. Um, but we are going to get this happening. Um, uh, it's still loading. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to pull it up on my own laptop. I am so sorry, everybody. This has been a, a trial here. Okay, we should be looking at uh, diversity. Yes, we are. Excellent. Okay, um, so uh, one of the major aspects in which uh, climate can affect uh, evolution on a broader scheme of things is uh, looking at um, kind of the concentrations of life in different parts of the world. Uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, was actually a study of kind of uh, vulnerable species and where these are most concentrated, so things that will be most dramatically affected by uh, future climate change. And this is also where we tend to see uh, our highest concentrations of diversity just in general. Um, so when we're looking at kind of parts of the world, we typically find in um, kind of the, the tropical areas is where we have our highest areas of diversity, and that's also kind of where the most potential for issues are going to be moving forward. And when we move into the fossil record, we do see a lot of these kinds of similarities. Um, so when you've got um, places that are were warm and tropical, you also s tend to see kind of um, heightened levels of different kinds of animals doing different kinds of things. Um, so in general, as we kind of increase uh, areas that are both uh, wet and or, um, are humid and warm, tend to create more opportunities for diversity to increase. However, um, that kind of regional area has shifted over time. So places like um, you know what are now very very arid Africa have in the past been very warm and wet places, or even very cold places, um, and and keeping that in mind as we move forward is one of the major factors in understanding this connection between um, life and, and climate through time. And, um, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, that connects with uh, body size. Um, so this is another huge, huge uh, factor in uh, how 
climate uh, affects evolution over time, and that's how big animals can get. Now, when um, kind of the, in the earlier studies looking at this over time was uh, tied in with Bergman's rule. If you're not familiar with uh, Bergman, uh, basically it's this idea that uh, larger animals um, will exist at higher latitudes or cooler climates than smaller versions of the same thing. So what we're looking at on the slide is a, a neat study that was done on moose um, across Sweden. Uh, we had kind of a, a large shift in latitude and finding that larger body size was um, occurring in that same kind of moose population at northern latitudes versus southern latitudes. And there's a bunch of other good examples um, of other kinds of animals, especially like bears. We have much smaller bears in southern climates and much bigger bears in northern climates. Um, but there's a big caveat to that, and that's um, with anything that's not warm-blooded, um, where it's actually the exact opposite of that. And I totally should have thrown in because of the personal connection to um, uh, Titanoboa, which is a great example of that. Um, so. Titanoboa is a, a massive giant snake that existed after the time of the dinosaurs, and it lived in uh, northern South America, a place that was very, very tropical. And in that warm tropical environment, you could actually get a much, much larger snake than you can today because it was much warmer even than today. Um, so you could get this massive 42-foot snake um, because the climate was much warmer. Now, if you look at mammals or any other warm-blooded animal, though, that relationship is the exact opposite. So that you have um, your smaller versions of the same kinds of animals in tropical environments and um, bigger versions in uh, cooler climates. So this is one of the reasons why during like the last ice age we see huge mammals across uh, large parts of the, the world including these you know mammoths and mastodons and giant ground sloths and other big big mammals um, whereas we don't really see much in the way of cold-blooded animals um, and this is one of the really big takeaways for me at least um, when we're starting to look into a warming climate in the future and that that is less favorable to these kind of larger bodied um, warm blooded creatures but more favorable to uh, ectothermic or cold blooded animals. Um, so as we kind of move into a warmer future this is actually not, at least kind of based on uh, our you know paleo history uh, less favorable to warm-blooded creatures and more favorable um, for cold-blooded creatures, at least in terms of, of larger body sizes. Um, let's see, but why were there giant kangaroos and llamas in the past while the modern versions are small? Um, so that's actually because it was in the times of, of giant kangaroos and, and, and llamas, these big camels and stuff that we had here in North America, it was actually much cooler back then than it is now. Uh, and then ultimately, actually, like uh, our camels in North America died out, giant kangaroos died out. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, right, so uh, uh, Adrian brought up uh, I thought oxygen levels had to do with it. It does, um, but that definitely affects some organisms more than others. Um, so things like insects um, are also limited based on oxygen. Uh, so one of the factors is temperature. They're, of course, quote, kind of cold blooded, really, they're ectothermic meaning they're getting a certain amount of uh, energy from their surrounding environment. Um, but when you go to uh, a certain body size, even for a, a warm environment, you need a certain level of oxygen to be able to get enough oxygen into their exoskeleton. Um, so when you look at times when insects and uh, other kind of exoskeleton uh, ectotherms were around, um, it was when it was both warm and you had incredibly high oxygen levels. And that was mostly in a time before the dinosaurs, when you got uh, a relative of the centipede that was six feet long. Massive, massive thing. Or you got, um, you know, spiders the, the size of like, a, you know, a bigger even than a basketball, like these massive, massive things. So oxygen can be one of the, the factors in that as well. Um, let me try and catch up a bit here. Both sides. Uh, large mammals would be better to retain body heat. Absolutely, yes. So, kind of having that um, lower surface area to the mass is much better in the cooler climates. It's one of the big reasons why you see um, things like mammoths uh, in these cold climates, and we don't have those anymore. 
Um, humidity uh, can indeed be a factor as well, especially for um, things like amphibians or things that are really dependent on, on water. So obviously just raising the temperature isn't enough for all things. Um, so that's, that's another kind of compounding factor. Another reason why it's important to understand all these different aspects of climate and the relationships to evolution and not just one factor. Uh, let's go to the next slide here. So I'll get to that up a bit. And this is just a, a general concept of, uh, oh yeah, so spiders bigger than basketballs. That's absolutely kind of uh, horrifying maybe a little bit, but it's all right. Uh, they're all long dead. Don't worry about it. Um, so abundance is another major factor in um, kind of how climate shapes things over time. That's basically just how uh, many of a kind of organism you can have um, sustained within an environment. So the example here is uh, just a school of sardine where you can get, you know, billions or at least thousands, if not, you know, up into millions of these uh, living within one single population there. Um, so that these uh, animals can, uh, they're getting enough food, they're getting enough energy from the surrounding environment that you can not only kind of keep these sardines alive, but you can keep them alive in enormous numbers. And that, of course, has huge effects across the entire ecosystem where you can have whole um, communities existing because of uh, these highly, highly abundant uh, animals. So you're having things eating them as well as things eating their byproducts as well. So they're kind of forming a, a part of the backbone of the ecosystem there because of their abundance. If you were to drop their numbers in half, that would have catastrophic effects across the ecosystem. So that abundance is a key factor in kind of, you know, whole uh, extinction level events could be driven from the abundances of certain species. Uh, and those are very largely driven by um, kind of the sustainability of the environment, which is driven by climate, driven by things like temperature, um, particularly in marine environments like this, um, as well as uh, levels of sunlight, which drives kind of photosynthesis in the, the base of those populations. Um, so that ends up being a major driving factor in whole large scale evolutionary changes. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, and that is going to be about faunal dynamics. Um, faunal dynamics basically just means the uh, differences within a population, different kinds of fauna. So this can tie in a bit with abundance, but it's a little bit different in that you can have um, shifts in the different kinds of animals within an environment. Um, so something in this case, I've got uh, just examples between browsers versus grazers. Um, so these are, uh, in the case of like uh, land mammals uh, that are both herbivores, you can have things like deer that are browsers that are living in uh, typically more foresty environments are typically eating things like uh, leaves and shrubs, um, whereas grazers are living in more open environments. So I've got a picture of a bison there. Um, they're eating a lot of grasses. And uh, those different kinds of fauna can have other kinds of effects on uh, the other in animals around them. But the reason that you're getting these shifts in fauna is often driven by climate shifts. So in the case of getting less deer and more bison is usually a case where you're getting less humidity, meaning that you're getting more of those grasses coming in. And as a result, you're going to have more grazers eating the grasses versus um, kind of a more humid environment that might... Uh, sustain a um, forested population, which then gives you more uh, things that are going to eat those forest environments. So even if you, for um, whatever reason, need to depend exclusively on the animal fossil record and not the plant fossil record for an area, which can and does happen, because fossilization is a very fickle kind of thing, uh, you can actually see cues in those environmental aspects that are driven by climate change, by the different kinds of fauna that you get there. And that, of course, has, you know, all these bigger effects on um, the kinds of animals that eat those animals as well. So this is um, kind of one of the, the major components that can be directly affected by climate. Um, and it's another thing to keep in mind as we change uh, our future climate, we can absolutely expect these faunal dynamics to shift. And those dynamics could shift favorably or they could shift very unfavorably for 
our kind of system. As we get a very hotter environment, we can also get a drier environment. That affects things like crops and the livestock and other kinds of things that we depend on. So this is another major, major key component to understanding um, what to anticipate for the future, and that's where the fossil record can really help us understand those dynamics. Uh, let's go to the next slide, because I want to allow for a little bit more discussion. Um, this is a little bit different from final dynamics. This is population dynamics. Now, what this is, is kind of your relative proportions of different life stages within the ecosystems there. So this is where you have, um, say you've got like a lot of babies, but not a lot of grown-ups, or a lot of grown-ups and not a lot of babies. Um, that has big shifts as well in... Um, Kind of how we interpret stuff. Actually, I should, I should read this bit on. Let's see, drought and wildfires affecting the food sources for browsers and grazers would seem to play a role as well. Yes, absolutely. So, drought, kind of aridity, is a major climate factor, which then also leads to wildfires, which can change the whole ecosystem as well. Um, these are large drivers from climate as well. Absolutely. Um, and bye, Nova. Thanks for joining us. Um, and let's see, so back to the population dynamics. Um, so on the slide here, what I've got is just a picture of tadpoles. Um, these are, amphibian is actually a really good example of population dynamics because they have such dramatically different life stages that you can really understand kind of how they're affecting differently. So you can imagine tadpoles that are strictly aquatic um, are feeding in a different environment for the most part um, and, and doing different kinds of things and having different diets versus frogs, they're kind of adult stage there. And having different proportions of those will also have ripple effects across the rest of the ecosystem. But because uh, for a lot of organisms, like amphibians, like reptiles, temperature is a large part in how they kind of shift to different life stages, especially um, in these kinds of amphibious or kind of multiple discrete life stage organisms, um, that also is largely connected to things like temperature and humidity. So that can have yet another kind of effect on an ecosystem that you can then scale up across a lot of things, especially when certain kinds of animals will even depend on certain life stages of different organisms for their diet. This used to be a popular theory in American plants. Razors were created by Native Americans who deforested central plants. I don't know if that theory still holds. That one's kind of a little younger for um, what I tend to study. Um, it, it is definitely an interesting point there, and it's um, something to keep in mind as well that kind of how different sorts of organisms are changing their own environment. Um, so things like bison um, and elephants and, of course, people have been able to actually shape the environments themselves. Or like beavers are good um, kind of climate... Uh, engineers in a way. Um, so that's kind of a, a another layer uh, to how we kind of understand uh, shifts in climate through time as well as kind of as we move forward. So kind of keeping in mind the ability to change those habitats can then kind of affect not only the animals there, um, but it can affect kind of surrounding areas as well. All kind of part of the fun complexity of, of life and climate. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so I wanted to throw in a couple of these um, that kind of have a little bit more to do with how we understand uh, the fossil record and how we really uh, get at those issues because um, particularly when we're thinking about things like diversity in the past, it's very tricky to understand um, when we're trying to compare it to modern ecosystems. And one of those uh, is just literally understanding what makes the species in the fossil record because how we define that has to be different from how we define it in biological systems today. So largely we go by the um, kind of biological species concept of uh, being able to create uh, viable offspring, right? Obviously that's a real problem to understand in the fossil record. So instead we have to go with um, things that you can recognize as being sort of distinct ways to identify them based on morphology, based on the anatomy, right? So what I brought up here is a slide of sparrows. Um, this is from a field guide for uh, many different species of sparrows. Now, if you're not familiar with sparrows, there are a lot of different species and they look really, really similar to each other. And a lot of the ways that you distinguish those species is based on very subtle markings of the feathers or even their calls. 
uh, which are features that are completely indistinguishable within the fossil record. If you look at these skeletons of these species of sparrow, they look absolutely identical. Um, and there's no good uh, skeletal anat anatomical differences between them. So if you're at that level where kind of our standard for species in the modern record is on things that we can't even see in the uh, osteological record, that kind of sets you at a different standard there. Um, so you kind of have to understand uh, kind of species level differences differently in the fossil record versus the modern record. Now that doesn't mean you can't make those comparisons, it's just one of the major factors that you need to keep in mind as you're kind of moving forward. That does help when you're looking at the fossil record, you're doing a little bit more apples to apples. So you are looking at kind of, if you're looking 100 million years ago and 50 million years ago, um, the same kinds of constraints for how we define a species are applying to those. The real difference is when you're looking much more recently in how we define those different species there. So when you look at something like the you know thousands and thousands of species of birds that we have alive today and we look in the past, we're not seeing nearly as many. A large part of that is because of that, um, just because of the nature of the record that we're working from. So it's not nearly as complete in that. Uh, are they genetically distinct, modern? I realize we can't gene test the fossil species. Right, so we can't test uh, genetics of the fossil species except in, in very rare circumstances for much more recent things. Um, and there are some kind of more recent uh, studies that have started to group together some of these modern populations, but there's also been a lot of work to split those modern populations. So genetics are helping kind of us better understand the modern uh, diversity to a certain extent, but uh, that's a very limiting factor because DNA typically only lasts for about 50,000 years. Um, so that very limits you when you're looking at a fossil record that goes back even billions of years. So you're only looking, you're only able to use that tool for much more recent. Um, all right, let's go to, uh, I just have one more slide. Um, and uh, we'll go to the last slide here because I want to put this last concept out there. And that's also just the, the bias of the fossil record itself. Um, so this is just a, a general diagram of the fossilization process um, where you go from, uh, in this case, an example of a dinosaur. Uh, usually all the uh, soft tissue is completely uh, decayed out and eaten by uh, microorganisms or bugs or even other big dinosaurs and stuff like that. Um, things typically get uh, buried in sediments. Uh, that then gets overlaid by uh, usually lots and lots of rock over time. Uh, the bone or whatever original biological material is then replaced by minerals. Uh, and then you have to have all that rock overhead uh, eroded out in order to expose enough to actually find some of the fossil remains there. And that's typically how we uh, even know about these ancient organisms. Now, there's a lot of things that have to happen before you actually go out and find your fossils. Now, typically also, the further back in time you go, the more kind of things might have happened to that rock that has caused it to be lost entirely. So you end up having this really biased kind of viewpoint into the past, where you're not getting a holistic view of everything that was alive. You're getting the view of whatever managed to get through all these filters and make its way all the way to the present and be found by a person who can then recognize what it is. And that's not to say that we don't know anything. We certainly know a lot of things. We just know that what we're seeing is a, you know, a select subset of what existed in the past. And this is another major factor for us to try and understand these larger scale evolutionary changes as they relate to climate, realizing that we're getting this kind of select group and we don't necessarily get uh, as much of a broad view as we would like. How common is it to find fossils exposed on the surface versus excavating them? Um, I would say almost all fossils, uh, I would say a very, very large proportion of them are found because at least part of them were exposed at the surface and that keyed you into that exact spot. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't that you don't run into other fossils because you saw maybe one sticking out 
um, and then you can find more buried in. There are other cases where um, something like a shale deposit where you can get lots and lots of stuff deposited in one area can be like, all right, okay, we've seen one at the surface, now we're going to really dig into this spot, and that can lead to many, many, many more fossils inside. Um, so there are some, but I'd still say the, the vast majority of fossils are recognized because at least part of them were exposed at the surface, even today. Pioneers in North Carolina often came across huge fossils and creek beds. They knew they were not representative of anything. Yeah, no, um, even in the early days, um, the science of paleontology goes back to the late 1700s, before we even really, before we knew evolution was uh, even as a concept. Um, there are already people kind of getting keyed into the idea of uh, this stuff just doesn't match anything that's alive today. Um, and it ended up tying in deeply with uh, um, kind of religious viewpoints of kind of the um, kind of concept that species couldn't possibly go extinct. And then kind of coming to terms with this idea and kind of trying to understand um, that the Earth is a lot older than we thought at first. We just didn't know. Figuring. Yeah. Was, yes, and absolutely, fossils were key to understanding geology in this deep time. Uh, kind of starting to understand um, just how much time is represented by these rock records and the fossils inside have really been helpful for understanding. Uh, it's back to earlier point. Paleontologists often define species based on bias stratigraphically or even in honor of themselves. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, kind of tying into that rock record there, understanding species can often uh, help you understand deep time as well as those uh, climatic shifts there. Um, so often uh, fossils are even uh, a better uh, or even more fine-tuned way of understanding the past climate than the rock itself. Um, so obviously if you're finding a lot of um, you know, clams and stuff like that, you're probably not looking at a desert environment. You're looking at like a lake or a seashore area. Um, so understanding the fossil record can really give us a, a broader sense of and a richer sense of the um, climate through time. Okay. Uh, okay. Fantastic, Alex. That was great. Um, we're just at about uh, one thirty now. I guess it's uh, uh, eleven thirty SLT time. So I'm afraid I think we really should wrap it up here. Um, great. Just in the just in the interest of time, if nothing else. Even sure. though this is a blast, and we could keep on talking about this stuff all day, I'm sure. Great. Well, thank so, you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad you persevered to uh, to be here to give us your presentation. It was totally worth it. Um, <laughs> and I also want to thank uh, my other panelists, uh, Stephen and um, and Mike. Um, yeah, thank and, you for uh, having us. And with that, I will uh, gavel our uh, panel discussion to a close and thank all the students for attending also. And, of course, thanks to Chantal and Jess for um, uh, sponsoring all of this. And good night.
kill you guys. I'm going home. Bye-bye, everybody.